The Chicken Ranch brothel was founded in LaGrange, Texas in 1844. It migrated to Nye County, Nevada in 1976 and was purchased by its current owner, Ken Green, in 1982. The ranch's history is rich and rather well documented. From tell-all books and historical accounts to movies and musicals, this cat house has a reputation for pushing the boundaries. And the world-famous Chicken Ranch is making history once again. Thanks to the amazing people who work as contractors and employees, this little house in the dusty town of Parump has become the birth site of groundbreaking policy changes and new horizons for the independent contractors who work in the four remaining brothels in Nye County. Katrina is a veteran at the Chicken Ranch, having worked there for 13 years. When I first started in 2009, um, I was, can I curse? Okay, I was scared shitless. I come from a uh, Fortune 500 company that tanked, and my friend used to work here, and she was telling me the money she made, and I'm like, no, I didn't believe her, like, you're yeah, right. So she sent me a check stub. I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, okay. I kid you not. The manager told me, um, I'm letting you know that it's harder for black ladies down here. I said, you know, I'm going to prove her wrong. And I sure did and been here ever since. I get this all the time. Um, well, they hire more black girls. Is it going to hurt your business? I said, no, not at all. I have repeat customers. They come and see me every time, so I don't worry about that. And we're also different shapes and sizes. So I'm like, more variety, the better. I'm a le legitimate business. I pay taxes. I needed help when we were shut down. I applied for the SBA loan and uh, immediately denied because I work in adult entertainment, which is bullshit. And I'm like, okay, I'm a small business like everyone else. Why aren't I getting the help? that I need. You can look at my tax return and you see that I make the money, so why don't I qualify? Like they say, it's a stigma. Everyone thinks we're unintelligent, uneducated, uh, on drugs, you name it, but we're not. A lot of us are very well educated on businesses, on properties. I'm like, just give us a chance. Just open your eyes. It's a re we are a legal, legitimate, reputable business. It's not like we're prostitutes on the street, and that's what you think when you call somebody a prostitute. Trudy is the madam at the chicken ranch. She is a liaison between the owner of the brothel and the independent contractors who work there. Before coming to the chicken ranch, I was actually at a dentist's house. I was able to take a lot of my female perspective and put it towards how I think women should be treated in a brothel and how anybody should be treated coming here. People need to be treated with respect first. I think all the ladies and the men now um, believe that we are a sisterhood, brotherhood. We believe in even the staff. We believe we're family. We want other people to understand that when they come in, but I don't think new people do. I think it takes a good three trips for them to really see like, oh, this is real. Like we do look out for each other. and. Even if we don't like each other, we want the best for each other during our business because we want everybody's business to flourish. Mine, yours, the other ICs, you know. She started in her current position in 2017 and in doing so, found her calling. Nine County Ordinance, it's the guidelines and rules and regulations of how a, a, a brothel is to operate daily. The ordinance is just the daily function and requirements of what the house is supposed to do what the staff is supposed to do and what the working um, ladies courtesans are supposed to do. In this last revision of the ordinance, they actually let me sit in, me and um, actually no other general manager, but me and the lawyer from another house. But um, we sat in there and I got to make the what practical comments, like how it really runs as opposed to how you think it runs and I got them to change from calling them ladies, working girls, prostitutes, to all being uniformed as courtesans. We are, deserve to have a title, and courtesan was the most fitting to encompass everybody. So some of the wording got changed in the ordinance, some of the 
you know, weird little quirks that they have. I wasn't instrumental in that. Some of my ladies in the house were mostly instrumental in that. They went and fought for that, and I, I stood behind them on that. I think our house has moved in such a positive direction since 2017. Is what makes me happy that they're happy to be here. So that's about it. Trudy often finds herself trying to find a compromise between the legislators and board of county commissioners and the courtesans who just want to run their businesses. But the courtesans themselves are the ones who ignite change in the industry. In fact, many of these independent contractors have a lot to say about local policy, decriminalization and social justice. The hard part is making sure their voices are actually heard and respected by the powers that be. Courtney Chase is one of the leading agents of change for full-service sex workers in Nevada. People come to brothels because it's the only option available. So basically you come onto the brothel property and you have to stay there the entire stay. Like you can't, if you live locally, you can't go home, you can't go to town and go grocery shopping other than the designate, designated time. So that's basically what being a lockdown house means. And what the uh, brothel owners were actually using as kind of an excuse to make their contracts lockdown per se, meaning we can't leave the property, was basically a law that stated if a courtesan was off the brothel's property for uh, longer than a period of 24 hours, that they would have to then be retested. So we came along and made the argument that that doesn't even make sense. Say that I go home, I'm exposed to something, and I come back to the brothel and I get tested. Um, it's not going to show up the very next day after I contracted it, you know what I mean? It's going to take a few days to a few weeks to a few months for certain things to even show up. So we basically got um, some medical professionals. Um, I used a study from UCLA. It is not testing that prevents STDs. The only thing in the world that prevents STDs is using a condom or not having sex at all. Um, testing is just like monitoring your health so that you spread it to less people. You're preventing the spread, you're not preventing the contraction of it. So we used all these things as arguments to basically say how that 24-hour rule was unnecessary. As long as a courtesan is tested every seven days, um, that's all that's necessary. We don't need additional testing every time we leave the property. Anybody who's a sex worker should be able to work in a brothel. It shouldn't be this brothel like choosing based on a certain image of whatever they want. It should be like we're, we already get business licenses, we're already independent contractors, I'm my own business so why isn't that available to more people? It's just like a set group of people and that's like the biggest problem that I have with brothels is the heavy regulations, the restrictions, and it's such a limited, limited number of people that are even able to work legally. And it's a whole two-tiered system where you're either criminalized or you're legalized. So the girls who work in Vegas, which is the majority of the sex workers in Nevada, get penalized for not being able to do it legally when they might not even get hired because they look a certain way or, you know, they're not a female or for whatever reason. And, you know, that's just kind of bullshit. Everybody should have, you know, a safe environment to be able to work in. If it's legal in the state of Nevada, it should be legal for everybody. There should be no restrictions. I actually started working in brothels to get away from arrest and abuse in the illegal industry. I was a victim of sex trafficking um, when I was a teenager and then, you know, I worked for agencies when I turned 18. Um, I gained a lot of experience and, and learned about screening and how to conduct yourself safely and get tested and use condoms. And um, at a certain point, uh, I decided to start like an assistant service to help girls advertise, to help them screen their customers so they at least know that they would know who that they would be dealing with instead of just dealing with random strangers on Craigslist or Backpage calling you and coming over now. You have some kind of uh, knowledge about who that person is as like a safety precaution. So I would help girls do that and um, I ended up getting arrested for it. I was facing a 10-year felony, 10-year maximum for promoting prostitution as a business or in-house brothel. Um, I was able Fortunately, because I was privileged enough to have money and stuff put away, I paid for a good lawyer. They, um, they lowered it from a felony down to a misdemeanor, but it still shows up as promoting prostitution. 
So that's another thing with criminalization. It really affects your ability to get jobs in housing. And, you know, working in a brothel is pretty much my only option. Like, my background check will flag basically anything at this point until I think like seven years after the offense or something crazy like that. It's considered a sex crime. So when I kept getting denied for apartments, that's what it would flag as a sex crime. And there's no like, you can murder somebody or rob somebody or whatever. And there was like this whole list of uh, offenses and how many years they look back for this offense five, this offense three, this offense seven. For sex crimes, it's lifetime. It could be 50 years ago. It will haunt you forever. And prostitution related charges are lumped together in, into sex crimes, including pedophilia and rape. And so it's just really disheartening because like, I've never hurt anybody. Why do I get lumped together with those people? It should never be the actual sex workers that are criminalized. When I was a victim of sex trafficking, right? Every other kid, 13 years old of age, that gets kidnapped, right? When, when, when they're found by the FBI or the police or whatever, they get to go home to their parents, right? Guess where I went? I got to go to a juvenile facility because prostitution was involved. I just got labeled a bad kid and thrown into a freaking jail cell. It's, it's just not right, you know, to not even have that chance to even become an adult and make the decision to do this. My hopes is that um, other courtesans might come around and, you know, try to organize, unionize, something of that sort. Um, I guess a lot of people are scared of the, the word union, and I've been kind of trying to talk about this for years. We have a system here now and I feel like it can be improved if people aren't ready for decriminalization yet. I feel like that's like the ultimate goal. Every sex, wor sex worker I talk to wants decriminalization and people freak out and like, oh, it's a free-for-all and, and whatever, but just look at New Zealand. There's brothels in New Zealand. There's independent workers in New Zealand. You can work either way. You have a choice. I feel safer working in a group, a collective of women. I'm gonna work in a brothel. Oh, I'd rather work it alone and have an in-call with my one friend. You have that option. Decriminalization is what everyone wants, but that doesn't mean that we should just like give up on what we already have. I feel like you have to win the first battle to win the war and having you know, getting people talking about legalization in Nevada and how the policies are and, you know, what should be changed and talking about, you know, the courtesans unionizing and stuff like that will bring a lot of attention to the sex industry in general to where, you know, as legal workers, I can talk about decriminalization and sex work without fear of being arrested. So I feel like our voices will be really strong and as other states decriminalize, you know, because there's bills in Oregon, there's bills in New York, bills in D.C., bills in Louisiana. Um, more and more people are talking about decriminalization, and I honestly believe, like marijuana, it's going to spread, you know, it's going to go from one state to the other. And the one benefit that sex work has that marijuana doesn't have is marijuana is federally illegal. Mar uh, prostitution is not federally illegal. Trafficking is federally illegal. Pimping is federally illegal. But prostitution itself, there's no federal laws against it. So nobody's going to come raid a brothel and shut it down like they would a dispensary. So I feel like once it goes mainstream and people really understand, you know, the industry and how, you know, decriminalizing it is the best harm reduction that you can possibly have. Where cat houses and strip clubs traditionally boast a competitive environment rife with infighting and volatile insecurity, this house is unique. Especially in recent years, the courtesans of the Chicken Ranch have begun to foster and emphasize a culture of sisterhood and of brotherhood. Meet Braden Hughes, who stylizes himself as Nevada's first boyfriend. I mean, I think well, there's no blueprint for it because nobody's ever done it before. It turns out that there is some, like, some level of complexity to it, um, particularly surrounding my my gender identity. Braden Hughes is the first transmasculine full service provider to work in the Nevada brothels. I mean, in the end, I think it's really only complicated because the brothel owners, they just kind of want it to be. Uh, <laughs> you know, just a few years ago, there was a rumor that men and masculine presenting courtesans and like transgender people 
in general uh, really couldn't actually work in brothels because of the law. Right? I say that in quotations because there is no law that says that, um, especially not in Nye County. Right? Like it's not written into the legislation. You know, there was this whole big to do with the brothel and the sheriff's office when I got my name and my gender marker changed because I had to go and get my sheriff's card and I actually had to make sure that the sheriff's office knew how to handle it. Um, and there was like a whole phone call about it uh, and I wasn't allowed to like record them saying that yes, like legally I can apply for a sheriff's card with a male gender marker and with my new name. Um, but really, the, the only people responsible, in my opinion, the only people responsible for propagating rumors like those ones in particular, are they're the ones in charge. <laughs> like, they would prefer that we keep our heads down and not ask questions. I worked at a house prior to this one where, like, any level of questioning, management, what they said, small things, big things, it didn't matter. It was just not acceptable. Like, there was a great way to get fired. Fired in quotations because if you're an independent contractor, technically they can't fire you, they just don't continue to contract with you. But for a lot of people, this is this is our bread and butter, you know? And a lot of the houses, um, less commonly now, but definitely back then, had non-compete clauses. So you agreed to only work at that house for a, a set amount of time. It was in, you know, it was written in the contract that you signed. Um, and the one that I worked at, they didn't have a non-compete clause, but if you went anywhere else, you couldn't come back. And that was scary. But, like, all of that said, the law is public knowledge, and it's available for everyone to read. We should be allowed to work in safe legal spaces. Like, all people. The point that I'm making here is marginalized and disenfranchised communities. What does the future hold for Brayden, or Katrina, or Courtney? What about those countless others who call this place home? What about those who would call it home if they could? Hopefully the future is bright. Hopefully the Nevada brothels will embrace inclusion, acceptance and camaraderie. Decriminalization is, in my opinion, I think it's on the horizon. I know that there are some people who are like, it'll never happen, and there are some people who are like, it shouldn't happen. Um, I think it should, but the thing is that like, even if it is coming, it's not here yet. And transgender workers and other marginalized communities who want to work in this industry and who do work in this industry and who are to an extent kind of required to work in this industry in order to survive, um, like this is, they're dying on the street and in jails because it's the only way that we can make money. And I chose to use my story to change that, right? Like I. I want to make it so that everyone, regardless of gender identity, regardless of race, regardless of background, can come and work in the brothels, regardless of HIV status, should be able to work in the houses. So I firmly believe that if I can prove that I'm profitable uh, as a trans person and sort of break that final barrier for people like me, the brothel owners will eventually let more of us into their houses across the board um, and fewer people will die while we're waiting for decriminalization to be realized. Uh, all right. So, and oh, also, do you want me to ask you questions to prompt, or do you just want to go? No, you can. I like when you ask questions. Okay. Yes. Cool. <laughs> then I will do that. So I don't ramble. Okay. All right. Go ahead and Yay. introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Katrina. The record to show that the Chicken Ranch pink and blue is the trans pride colors. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Trudy. Awesome. <laughs>
Thank you so much. That You're was welcome. wonderful. I agree. Thank you. You did awesome. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> sweetie. Sorry. You weren't good. <laughs> oh, you're adorable. I'm not sure how much I trust these things. Um, I wouldn't, because it's freaking a brothel. Yeah, that's fair. It really does.